And three, two, one, and we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rip Estelston. And I want to welcome you to our fourth Rip's Rescue virtual event. Today is February 7th, 2022. Uh, for those of you that feel the urge to go get a, uh, a bite or maybe watch the Olympics, I want you to know that we will be replaying this whole show uh, Thursday, February 10th, as part of the Plant Strong podcast. So no worries there. Um, I want you to know just to start off tonight that our mission at Plant Strong is to arm you with as many tools, resources, information, tips, but really most importantly, the most supportive community on the planet to make this lifestyle as simple as possible to set you guys up for success where most of us need it the most, and that is with our health. Um, as many of you know, I spent 12 years as a firefighter answering calls for help, and now I am dedicated 100% to helping people rescue themselves by sharing evidence-based information and dismantling the myths and the misinformation that is swirling around out there. Uh, as I said, this is our fourth Rips Rescue event. Tonight, we're gonna be concentrating on all things plant-based and athletic performance. Our first Rips Rescue was about preventing and reversing heart disease. I invited my father, Dr. Carlo B. Esselstyn, my mother, Ann Kryle Esselstyn, and Dr. Brian Aspel, an amazing cardiologist, to join me for that uh, episode. Episode two was all about <clears throat> losing weight without losing your mind. And I had the brilliant Dr. Douglas Lyle, the author of The Pleasure Trap, join me for that Rips Rescue. Our third Rips Rescue, I had the incomparable Dr. Aaron Spitz, and it was all about men's health. Uh, and we specifically talked about prostate health and also erectile dysfunction. And tonight, with the backdrop of the Winter Olympic Games in China and just a stone's throw away in the future, the Super Bowl, we thought it would be appropriate to bring you athletic performance utilizing a plant-based diet, right? Why a plant-based diet? can optimize your athletic performance and support you and uh, aid you everything when it comes to an active lifestyle and athletic performance. And we have one of the most brilliant physicians uh, and knowledgeable on the planet joining me tonight. And I'll bring him in in just a sec. But before I do, as a thank you to each and every one of you we're going to be giving you a free guidebook. It's called the Big Game Recipe Guide with 11 mouthwatering recipes. And uh, we're going to provide a link in the chat section here today. And it also will be in the show notes uh, of today's episode and also in the, in the podcast. Now, I know we have a lot of new people here tonight. And... Um, I wanna thank you for coming and for your interest in all things plants. Let me say that for those of you that don't know a lot about me, let me just give you a quick little intro here. Um, I was hugely inspired to go down this path by my father, Dr. Carlo B. Esselstyn Jr. and his research at the Cleveland Clinic going back to 1984, showing that you can not only prevent, but you can actually reverse heart disease by eating a whole food plant-based diet. I started eating this way, uh, full kale, full stop. Back in 1987, I had just graduated from the University of Texas at Austin, um, where I graduated with a degree in speech communications. I also went there on a swimming scholarship where I was a three-time All-American. And now I was trying my hand at professional triathlons. 
And um, because I was just getting into fueling myself with plants uh, to give me a leg up on the competition, I was just super excited as far as what plants could do to allow me to recover quicker between workouts, uh, increase my stamina, um, increase my immune system. So I hardly ever got sick. It also sped up any potential injuries that I had. And it also, as you're going to hear about tonight, provided more blood flow to all of my working muscles where I needed it the most. Um, after 10 years as a world-class triathlete, I then transitioned to being a firefighter with the city of Austin, Texas. And it was there at fire station two that I introduced my, my love affair and my passion to plants to the guys uh, at station two. And one of the guys was really a heart attack waiting to happen. As it turns out, um, he had a horrendous family history of men in his family dying before the age of 50 from heart, uh, from heart disease. And, uh, and so it was really cool to get everybody <clears throat> on board with this lifestyle and, and the rest is history that then turned into the books and, uh, and a lot of other things. It was while I was a firefighter at, um, for the city of Austin that I competed in the largest athletic competition on the planet. And that was the police fire world games. These took place in Indianapolis, Indiana in 2001. And I competed in two, actually three events. I competed in the Olympic a distance, the Olympic distance triathlon. It was a 1.5K swim, 40K bike, and a 10K run. I also com competed in singles ping pong and doubles ping pong. In the, Austin, uh, in the Austin Fire Department, I was really one of the top ping pong players. And so I thought I'd try my hand at the police fire world games. Fortunately, in the triathlon, I was, um, I had a great race and I was able to bring home the gold. So I got the gold medal uh, in the Olympic distance triathlon. In ping pong, I wasn't so lucky. I got my, my, uh, <laughs> my clock clean, so to speak. There are so many amazing ping pong players around the globe and I didn't make it past the third round, but I had a lot of fun. Um, and as you guys can imagine, because, you know, I've been swimming and biking and running for so long, it's, it's literally, it's in my blood and I do it to this day. But two and a half years ago, I, uh, I decided that I would go for the world record in the men's 200 meter backstroke for men 55 to 59. And I was fortunate. I was able to break the old world record in July of 2019. And then a month later, I was able to break my own world record by a little over a second. And this is just to show people that you can be in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and not only be at the top of your game when it comes to being optimally healthy, but also at the top of your game when it comes to being physically active and, uh, and athletic. And so as you guys can imagine, I have literally dedicated this second half of my life to being a crusader for the advancement of all things plants. Um, and I want people to understand the benefits of a plant strong lifestyle when it comes to our personal health, when it comes to the health of the planet, and then also for us as human beings, just to be a more kinder and compassionate um, people. Now, I have known a lot of athletes since I embarked on being an athlete myself. Let's just say going back to when I was about 14 years old as a high school athlete. And I have known world record holders. I've known Olympic gold medalists. I have known all Americans and weekend warriors. And I want you to know that one of the things that I love about athletes is they are eternally optimistic. I adore that about athletes. They're very competitive in nature. They have an open mind when it comes to learning new techniques and advances in the sport, whether it's 
lifting weights, whether it's new positions, aerodynamic positions. When I first started in triathlons, they didn't have the aerodynamic bars. And a lot of the athletes uh, were a little reluctant to embrace the, the, this position, but before long, everybody had adapted it. But the one thing that I have found that most athletes are really stubborn on is changing how they fuel themselves. And they are, they've been so programmed into this archaic um, kind of notion that we need red meat and chicken and fish for protein. We need dairy for calcium and minerals and strong bones. We need oils, uh, you know, for brain health and heart health. And the science does not support this one iota. And you're going to hear in just a sec from the man himself. Um, but so the, these athletes, they are inadvertently putting in a dirty fuel source into these Porsches and Corvettes of bodies, and they're not getting everything that they could. And if they would embrace what they heard in the Game Changers film, embrace so much that's in so many of these um, groundbreaking uh, books right now about enhancing uh, performance with a plant-based diet. Um, really, the sky is the limit. So with that, I want to say that I have one of the most knowledgeable men uh, on the planet when it comes to athletic performance and the power of plants. His name is Dr. Jim Loomis. Um, and he is He's the perfect guy because right ahead of the Super Bowl, we have a gentleman that not only has a Super Bowl ring, he also has a World Series ring. And uh, that is because um, he won a World Series ring when he was the team physician for the St. Louis Rams, and he won the World Series ring when he was the physician for the St. Louis Cardinals. Pretty darn crazy. Uh, but he's joining us right now from Saudi Arabia where it's 3 a.m. And I'm gonna let him explain all about that here in just a second. A little background on Jim. He is an internal medicine physician who has served um, as the team doc, as I said, for both the St. Louis Rams and the St. Louis Cardinals. He also is a diplomat of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And when he's not seeing patients at the Bernard, Barnard Medical Center, just outside Washington, DC, he is swimming, biking and running. And at the age of 63, just before COVID hit, he completed his first Ironman triathlon. So with that, Jim, if you could join me and turn on your screen, that'd be awesome. There Thank you, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. It is it is our pleasure. So for starters, will you tell me, what are you doing in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm here to speak, actually, believe it or not, on exercise and plant-based diets at a lifestyle medicine conference that's occurring later this week. Um, it's, it's part of a broader lifestyle medicine uh, focus that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has. You know, Saudi Arabia, people may not realize this, has one of the fastest growing rates of type 2 diabetes and obesity in the world, actually, um, mainly because of westernization of their food. And so um, um, we're here to kind of educate both physicians and the lay public about the power of plants. Right. So tell me this. Are you going to be tuning into the Super Bowl next weekend? I am. I get back on uh, Saturday. So um, hopefully after overcoming jet lag, I will... I will uh, be rooting for the Rams to to you will. their their world their uh, their world title world championship. So even though it's not the St. Louis Rams, it's the Los Angeles Rams. You still have an affinity for the Rams. I do. I do. Wow. Wow. So um, you know when the Game Changers came out, you know you had a, a really beautiful role in that film. But if you remember, the Tennessee Titans had like fifteen or sixteen. Yeah members of their squad that were plant-based. Um, and this year, they had one of their best years in a long, long time. Do you know, are you at all in touch if 
like they still have a large contingency of their team that's plant-based? Yeah, you know, I don't know that. Although, um, you, know, you know, across really all professional sports, we're seeing every day, you're reading the news, you know, NFL players, NBA players, hockey players, soccer players, Olympians uh, who have adapted a plant-based diet. And so I think, you know, and I, I hope, I, I would like to think that the game changers played a role in that. And, and really, as you said, as you said earlier, you know, dispelling all the, this mythology we have around, around plants. I mean, I, I remember we'd go to the, I was with the Rams before I went plant-based and I mean, we go to the pregame meal on you know, Sunday morning and, and what would, what was the spread, right? It was ch chicken breast and steak and pasta because you had to get your carbs and your protein, right? Um, it, it was really, it was really uh, crazy how pervasive and, and as you said, how unknowledgeable, if you will, yeah. Or, or that that even these high level professional athletes were about how to fuel their bodies. So you so you just said that, and I'm seeing it too. I think we all are. Everywhere we turn, we're seeing another NBA player or or NFL player uh, or professional hockey player, baseball player that's you know uh, race car drivers that right. are becoming plant based. Why do you think that is? Well, it, you know, I, I think. The, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, right? And you've experienced this. I experienced this. When you adapt a plant-based diet, your ability, I, I think it's the ability to recover. I think that's the, that's the, that's the magic sauce there. When, you, when, when, when people transition to a plant-based diet, and Derek Morgan from the Titans talked about this in Game Changers, you know, the injury rate in the NFL is 100%. And um, the, the ability to recover after you get beat up during a football game because a plant-based diet is so highly anti-inflammatory. It's packed full of antioxidants to mitigate the oxidative stress that comes with exercise. I think that players feel so much better. And it's very interesting at the LA premiere of game changers. I was speaking with Chris Paul, you know, the NBA player. Yeah. yeah. And he, he had, he, he told me that I was literally kind of blew me away. He said, you know, when he went plant-based, he didn't want to tell any of his teammates or, 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 or colleagues, not because they would have made fun of him because that's what would have happened five or 10 years ago. It was because he didn't want to give away the secret. He <laughs> felt like it, 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 it enhanced his performance so much. He didn't want to, he didn't want to let everybody else in on the, on the, on the deal, which is, I, I was like, Holy cow, that's amazing. Uh -huh. A little, little selfish, but, and then you got people like, I think oh, what, Carmelo, Anthony, Anthony Carmelo, yeah. right. Carmelo, Anthony, who's yeah. plant-based. I'm actually yeah. surprised that, that he has not persuaded his good, buddy lebron james to do it yeah 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 and i think kylie irving is the other big plant-based oh, yeah. nba guy yeah yeah, yeah so yeah Ky kyrie's kind of getting smacked pretty hard right now because of his stance on vaccinations yeah as is, yeah. As is one of the most amazing plant-based athletes out there novik joke yeah. yeah 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 i was just gonna say yeah yeah i mean you talk about a athlete that needs to recover quickly between their matches right right, right. that's exactly right player. Yeah, my, my sister's a, a, a teaching professional and, and her husband down in Naples, and they're both uh, very competitive. I think between the two of them, they have 50, 60 uh, gold balls, you know, national championships through the, through the years. And um, um, they both transitioned to, to at least a plant strong diet. And, and, um, yeah. um, and, 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 you know, they see that the benefit as well. So let me, let me back up for a sec. And sure. do, do you think it is interesting that the ideal diet for not only warding off like chronic Western disease, heart disease, diabetes, major cancer, also just happens to be the optimal diet for athletic performance. You know, Rip, that doesn't surprise me at all because, you know, as I've, as I've educated myself and really thought very deeply about this, you know, if you ask the fundamental question, as human beings, what did we evolve to do? right? Well, we evolved to try to live long enough to find a mate and pass on our DNA, right? And that's true for any living creature. And, and for most of human history, we had to perform two tasks primarily for that to occur. Find food when we're starving, not be someone else's food when they're starving. Right. That's where our stress came from. How do we respond to the stress? Physical activity, right? And, 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 it, and assuming we survived, we didn't starve, we didn't get eaten by the leopard. That's when we'd rest, recover, and refuel. And what do we refuel with? You know, our ancestors, despite what we may perceive, weren't hunter-gatherers. We were gatherer-hunters, right? And what we gathered was unprocessed plants, roots, stems, leaves, seeds, fruits, nuts, vegetables, berries. There was no white flower tree or canola oil bush, you know? That, um, we didn't have dairy because we hadn't domesticated other mammals. That didn't occur until seven, 8,000 years ago. 
Um, and our ancestors did eat a little bit of meat, but A, it wasn't very much. We don't know for sure, probably 20, 25% of our total calories. B, it was wild animals, not cows, pigs, chickens, and fish stuffed full of corn antibiotics and hormones. Yeah. But I think most importantly, you could argue our ancestors had a survival advantage to have in concentrated animal fat and protein to get big and strong, get away from leopard before they died of some infectious disease when they were 30. So they never had to worry about if I eat all this meat, am I going to get cancer, or have diabetes because they were already dead. And we've unmasked now these chronic conditions, all of which are associated with the overconsumption of these highly processed foods and animal-based foods. And then you step back, as you've already said, and, and think about the impact the way we raise animals say, has on the climate, the way we treat animals. You know, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that the optimum diet for, for human health, planetary health, human performance, and the most compassionate diet we can consume if we care about other creatures is a plant-based diet. I mean, it makes perfect sense if you, if, you, if you look at it through the lens of our evolutionary biology. Yeah, well, we just gotta get, we gotta get, we gotta get people deprogrammed into thinking right. that they can get everything that they need in a better, safer, in some cases, more observable form from plants than, than animal products. That's right, that's right, that's exactly right. And uh, you know, it's, it's this whole idea about nutrient density, right? Um, yeah, you know, yeah. super Super Bowl's coming up. You open a bag of Doritos. How hard would it be to eat a thousand calories of Doritos for the game's over? Right, well, not hard at all. Eat a thousand <laughs> calories of apples. Right, <laughs> eat a thousand calories of apples in a week. Right, I mean, it's like ten pounds. Right, um, and and so so you know, and and what else? You know, when you eat those Doritos, you're just getting, you know, there's no fiber, there's no protein, there's no cancer fighting phytonutrients, and so again, that's yeah. why the plants are so important. So. Let me ask you this. We have roughly 600 muscles throughout our body. Um, what do, as an athlete, what do our muscles need, crave for fuel? Right. So we, we, we have three kind of primary gas tanks that we use to fuel ourselves. We have what's called ATP, um, which we use for very short. If you're going to, if you're going to run a hundred yard, hundred meter dash or lift weights, you know, that, that's, it's about 90 seconds worth max of energy. Yeah. Um, but the primary sources of, of, of fuel are glycogen, which is how we store sugar or carbohydrate in our muscles. And we use that for, for um, exercise up to about an hour and a half, two hours. Now you can train yourself to, to, to extend that a little bit. Um, um, and, and, and we use that for exercise up to a couple hours for more, a little bit more intense exercise. If you have to sprint up a hill or, or something like that. And then, and then for longer, more low key, low, less in, less um, um, uh, intense exercise, we use fat, uh, which which we can liberate into our bloodstream, which our muscles can burn for fuel. And in fact, especially an endurance athlete, the more effective you become at, at burning fat, the longer you can, can you can conserve that glycogen, that muscle. Because yeah. uh, you know, I was a marathon runner in, in med school, pretty competitive, and and I remember the first marathon I ran, you know, hitting the wall and. and if you've ever had that experience, it's not much fun. And that comes when you, that actually, the, the cause of that is that felt to be because when you deplete your muscles of, of glycogen um, and, and you lose that fuel source. So no, um, no, but, no, but carb, fun. yeah, no fun at all. But carb, but glycogen is the primary source uh, and, and then fat on top of that for, for longer, um, uh, longer periods of time when you exercise. Yeah. Well, you know who I had on the, the, the Plant Strong podcast a couple of weeks ago, was Harvey Lewis. Have you heard of Harvey? Right. Yeah. I mean, the dude is the ultra distance running machine. Yeah. On the yep. bad water, 135, you know, one, yeah. uh, what the big dog's backyard. He did 356 miles and like yeah, three and crazy, half. crazy. I mean that, but he has learned, he has taught his body how to basically optimize that perfect flame of carbohydrates and fat. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I mean, having a, gotten to know Scott Jurek, who's also a, yes. a, an amazing ultra uh, distance runner uh, through, through Game Changers. I mean, the same thing. It's, it's, it's really phenomenal, it, it, especially for ultra endurance, how, how, how effective a plant-based diet is in fueling your body. Right. Tell me, when you were the physician for the, um, the Rams and for the Cardinals, uh, did you have any idea of the role that nutrition played in sports? No, no. I mean, you know, like everybody else, you know, uh, you needed carbs. You needed to do good. If you're going to go work out, you need to do your goose on a long run. And then, and then you need your protein, right. And then you need to eat pasta 
after or before to, you know, carb load and all that. I, I really had no idea. And, um, um, you know, when, when I started, you know, I went plant-based about 10 years ago, basically for some, some personal health issues. I, you know, I, I thought eating healthy was low fat dairy and lean meat and fruits and vegetables and try not to eat too much ice cream. And unfortunately found out you can't outrun a mediocre diet after knee oh. injury. Uh, you know, I, I, after knee injury, I gained a lot of weight. And next thing I know, I had sleep apnea and I'm wearing a sexy CPAP machine at night. My cholesterol's through the roof. I'm on cholesterol meds. I got borderline diabetes. You know, I'm in St. Louis. My buddies at Wash U, world-class doctor, taking care of me. I, I, you know, they didn't talk to me about this stuff. I'm on pills and CPAP on and on. Laying on the couch one day, see, game, see forks over knives and thought, right. wow, food is medicine. Who knew, right? Transition to a plant-based, <laughs> right. Transition to a plant-based diet. And then made a commitment to rehab my knee, which I hadn't done after surgery, which because I'm, you know, doctors aren't very good patients. Four months later, you come out the other end. I'd lost 40, 50 pounds. My cholesterol dropped 100 points. I had atrial fibrillation from the from the sleep apnea that went away. Allergies went away. Asthma went away. Sleep apnea went away. Could exercise again. And that put me on this journey. Um, um, did you did you, you know, even did you even realize how miserable you were? with all that going on? Yes. I did after the fact, right? I mean, I did after the fact, because again, when you start to fuel your body, when, when you know, when, we, when you start to fuel your body the, the right way, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, here I am, you know, people, I'm, I'll be 63 in, in a few months. And, you know, people ask me, oh, I am, you know, I tell them I'm 60 with 62 and a half years experience. I mean, I'm 30, I'm 30 with 32 and a half years experience, right? Because that's how I feel. And, and, and I think that what people don't really realize, and you kind of alluded to this, that we have the ability when we lead a healthy lifestyle through regular physical activity, eating the right foods, getting a good night's sleep, not drinking too much alcohol, not smoking, we can decouple our biologic age from our chronologic age. We can, in fact, become younger next year. And that's really the key here, right, For, to, be, to, to lead a healthful, full life. I mean, look at your dad as a perfect example, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. unbelievable, yeah. right? So anyway, that. Let, let, so um, let's let's circle back to this is something you talked about in the game changers and you did it very eloquently and it's the white elephant in the room typically everywhere that we go and it's it's the question that if you and I you know got a penny or rather a nickel for every time it was asked <laughs> you know we'd we'd have a couple thousand dollars and yeah. that is Jim but where in the world am I going to get my protein and then the second part of that is okay, but is it an inferior source of protein right. and, it, and is it complete? How do you, how do you address that? Well, so the simple kind of snarky answer is, <laughs> yeah. is, you know, when people ask me, I say, well, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you turned on National Geographic and saw a special on mountain gorillas or elephants? And the first thing that popped in your mind is, oh my God, where do they get their protein? Like never, right? Well, where do they get their protein? Some of the biggest, strongest animals on, on the planet, they're herbivores, right? They get their protein the same place the cow got its protein that 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 we consume the same place the chicken got its protein you know on and on so so you know and in fact back back to this idea about evolutionary biology if you think about it those animals have just served as the middleman for the nutrition right they've they've eaten the plants they've used all the good stuff the fiber the antioxidants and you know cancer fighting phytonutrients to run their own machinery they concentrate what's left in the protein and fat which we consume and when we're starved for calories yes that probably did have a survival advantage but in the modern world because most of us aren't starved for calories anymore we have the luxury of skipping the middleman and so there is plenty of protein in plants i mean there's almost as much protein in 100 calories of broccoli as there's in an egg right and people people have no idea they 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 don't they don't you know plants have protein and it's it's somewhat frustrating sometimes because people just don't get it. They just don't get it. And, you know, okay, well, you know, how much protein powder should I take after my workout? Even, even after you, know, you go through the whole spiel, they still don't yeah, get yeah. it. And that's probably one of the toughest um, myths to break. And, and oftentimes, you know, if you think about it, so, so let's just talk real quick about protein requirements. So for the, for the average person, average activity, we need about 0.8 grams per kilogram of protein. If you're an endurance athlete, a little bit more, 1.2, 1.6, you're a weightlifter, maybe up to two grams per so kilogram. How did, for, so for people that that means absolutely nothing, if I'm a 150 pound male or female, what does that mean? And yeah, so, so that'd be about 70, it's about, that'd be about, uh, about 70, 65, 70 grams somewhere. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so the thing is though, right. I'm training for Ironman, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm not eating. So, so if, if, so if someone's on say a 2000, 1800 calorie diet, right, which is about average, that works out for an average size person right at 0 0.8 grams per kilogram. I'm training for Ironman. I need more protein, right? But I'm not eating 1800 calories a day. I'm eating 3,600, 4,000 calories. So what's happened to my protein intake? It's doubled, which yeah. is exactly what I need. So it's not, it's not protein we need to worry about. It's calories, right? And if we get enough calories, you will get enough protein. And this idea, just the, the second part of that, this idea that, oh, you know, plant-based proteins aren't complete is, is based on some, some research that was done a long time ago that's flawed. And it's just, it's, I mean, plants have, it is impossible, impossible if you're consuming enough calories to become deficient in any given amino acid. And because the way, pro, you know, when we eat, when we consume protein, we don't absorb protein, right? The protein is actually, so proteins are made up of these strings of amino acids. Right. And when we consume them, they get broken down in our gut to the individual amino acids. We, 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 we absorb those and take them to the liver. They're kind of reassembled into whatever proteins we need, whether it be building muscle or repairing tissue or day-to-day -day maintenance kind of stuff. So, so again, this idea that, that, that we can't get you know, the right, the proper amount or that they're not complete is just not true. Right. So you mentioned like at the very, very beginning that, so these animals, they will eat, the let's say the grass or the grains or whatever and then it's concentrated in their i guess tissues as fat and protein but like so but why then when we eat the the this animal tissue this animal muscle is it what makes it an unhealthier form of protein or fat than than the original protein sure. and fat yeah, that's a great question. So, so there's a couple, a couple of things. So number one is um, the average person in the Western world, we way over consume protein, right? So, so we can, when we, when we, when we, when we take an extra carbohydrate, we can, we store that as muscle and liver glycogen. When we take an extra fat, when we take in fat, we store whatever's left in our fat stores for energy, but we can't store extra protein, right? So once we kind of done its thing, it gets converted to nitrogen and excreted in, in the urine. And so it puts a strain on our kidneys and, and, and it's associated with, with other chronic diseases, cancer in particular. And the reason is, is that the makeup, the amino acids, so some of the amino acids we consume are what are called methylated. They have sulfur compounds stuck on them. And those have been shown to be much more likely to interact with our DNA and damage the DNA. So it's these methylated proteins, which are in much higher concentrations in meat and dairy than you see in, in plants. So it's these, these methylated amino acids. And that's one of the theories. In fact, there was a, a study done a few years ago that looked at middle-aged men and they had like an 800 times increased risk of, of, of cancer yeah. when they consume animal-based proteins. And if you over-consume protein in general, Animal proteins in particular, and even if you overconsume some plant-based proteins, it did not seem to carry the same cancer risk. And the theory was, and then the other part of it is many of these proteins activate what's called IGF-1, and there's high levels of IGF-1 in particular, insulin growth factor 1, and dairy in particular. And that's yeah. a growth yeah. hormone because, you know, what is dairy, right? Dairy is a biologic fluid that evolves species-specific to facilitate baby mammals turning into mammals big enough to find food on their own. And so cows need a lot of IGF-1 because they got to get big quick. Yeah. And by the way, you know, and, then, and by the way, once that, once that happens, we don't need our mother's milk. And that's why you don't go into the grocery store today and see big shelves full of human milk to bring home and put on your cereal. I mean, you would find that very bizarre, I think. So the idea we should be consuming another mammal's milk that evolved to facilitate a 70 pound cow turning 700 pound cow just doesn't make any sense whatsoever biologically. And, and again, it's, it's felt that the, the high levels of IGF-1, particularly in dairy, and then that gets concentrated in cheese. Um, is one of the reasons that these animal-based proteins are less healthful. Right. Um, I want to go back to a second, for a second, to muscles, because a lot of people are, they're concerned that eating a plant-based diet, they're not going to get as muscular as they'd like to. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, guys and gals that want to beef up, so to speak, can they do it with, with, with kale and brown rice and broccoli? Oh, sure. Yeah, so, so there have been numerous studies that have looked directly at that question, comparing animal-based proteins versus plant-based proteins and, and, um, um, uh, and see if there's an advantage. And, and the thing is, they're equal. So there's no, there's no downside. You can build the same muscle 
with plant-based proteins, with animal-based proteins. It's not an advantage for muscle building, animal-based, but there's a health advantage because sometimes we, you know, we practice health reductionism, right? Just like we practice nutritional reductionism. Um, you know, we, we treat building muscle different than lowering your cancer risk, different than treating diabetes or preventing diabetes, different than treating heart disease. We think of those as different things, but if you back it up, it's all, it's all the same thing, right? So, the, right. so, so when we overconsume protein, yeah, you might be able to build, you build muscle, but you know, if you're consuming the wrong kinds of protein or you're overconsuming it, you know, you build muscle. Yes. But you know, you increase your risk for things like heart disease and cancer and diabetes and things like that. So, so there's, there's tons and tons of evidence out there to suggest that, that there's no downside from a muscle building standpoint, plant versus animal. There's lots and lots and lots of upside. The plant-based proteins, if you look at your over, and then you've already talked, and then you, again, the environment, there's other, there's, if you, yeah. if you really broaden the lens, there's lots of reasons to, to, to so, use plant-based so, proteins. And so as it is like you and I, for example, as endurance athletes, our protein requirements might be a little bit different than somebody that's just yeah. trying to be like a, a bodybuilder, so to speak, right? That's right. Right. Yeah. But it's calories, but it's calories that are driving it. Now, now there are some very nuanced, I mean, this only applies to a very, very small percentage of people. If you're, if you're a professional bodybuilder and you're trying to cut for competition or something like that, but, but, you know, the vast, you know, 99.9% .9 of the general population, they're not Ironman triathletes and they're not, they're not professional bodybuilders or professional football players. So, so, um, but even those, even like yourself, you know, high, high functioning world-class athlete, um, um, for the most part, it's the same food your father eats, right? You, just probably, you eat more of it, right? That's a lot more of it, a lot more of it. So when you when you were training for your Ironman, you know, two years ago, did you ever keep track of like how many grams of anything you were you no. were getting? No, you just no, ate. I, I just ate. I ate when I was hungry, and I ate a lot. Like you said, I mean, because you know, yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's actually interesting. I mean, it's the the hard part's keeping weight on. Cause you're, you know, especially toward the end of your training cycle when you're, you know, exercising 15, 20 hours a week, you know, yeah. it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to keep the calories, get enough calories in. So that might be the answer to my next question, but so I think we may have a lot of new people yeah. that are, that are interested in adopting a plant-based diet to kind of optimize their athletic performance. Right. What do you find are like the one or two major mistakes that people make as they kind of, you know, wade into this lifestyle as athletes? Well, so, so one thing is, um, especially if you're not on a plant, a plant strong diet already, um, it's, you know, you certainly don't want to make that switch in the middle of a competitive cycle, right? Because, because it, it will take some time for your gut to get used to it. You know, it's a very high fiber diet. A lot of people will experience some transient GI distress, um, and so you, you you know just like just like you don't go from zero to sixty, you don't you don't go from not training at all to go out and running twenty six miles. You train your body, right? We have to train our gut over the course of you know th four to six weeks to kind of get used to that high fiber diet. So one is is jumping right into it all the way, and then and then that you, you experience a lot of gas and GI discomfort, and so you say, well, this this is I, I'm not gonna I can't do this, right? Um, the other is the other thing I think a lot of people still have this notion that they're not getting a protein. And, and so what I do there, I, I have them use a, a food tracking app for a couple of days, like, like chronometer or my fitness pal, and I actually have them keep a food diary. And because, right. because again, and, and, and look at those numbers and see, and I have never had anybody who did that, who came back and said, you, you know, I was right. I wasn't getting enough protein. Right. So, so I, I use that sometimes just to reassure people that they are, are in fact, you, you're getting plenty of the, the nutrients that you need, including protein. Yeah, yeah. I think those are the two biggest ones. So one I, is, is jumping in too much and with the GI stuff and then the yeah. others overcoming the fallacy of protein. Yeah. The, 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 the other one that I'll throw in there is I find that a lot of times people, they transition to this lifestyle and they're eating about the same quantity of food, but oh, yeah. getting, getting two thirds of the calories. And so they don't- right. get, feel quite as, as energized. And it's just a matter right. of them. They have to eat more. Right, right. No, that's a great point. That, that, that's exactly right. And so it does, I mean, 
you you know this as well. I mean, you know, you're noshing all day long, right? Yeah. I mean, I've got fruit, and you know, I mean, so so it's it's really uh, because you do get full because a plant based diet is so nutrient dense, um, and and that that it does you do have to consume a much larger quantity, and so so you're exactly right. Helping people people understand that that you may have to have three or four or five meals a day, small meals a day, paste out yeah. through the day to get enough because you can't load up. The, the thing is, you can't, you know, you can't sit down. I mean, there is a physical limit to how many plants you can eat because of all that fiber, you get full, right? So, so you do have to feed more frequently to be sure you're getting enough calories. That's, that's well, not only, and, and, and not only the fiber, Dr. Loomis, but the other thing that plants have in abundance that we love as athletes is H2O. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, and what yeah. are we, 60% water? Yeah, that's exactly right. And you what, you lose 10% of your 10% of your um, you know, your your water by getting dehydrated, and that severely affects performance. Sure, that's exactly right. And you know, thirst is not a good indicator. And so so um that's another thing a lot of people struggle with. And so I, I usually either have people weigh every day. Any short-term weight loss is is not fat. Um, you know, on average, if you're trying to lose weight, you might see a one to two pounds a week. So one pound a week is a seventh of a pound a day. You go out on in, on a hard bike ride or a run, you know, you come back, you've lost two or three pounds. That's not fat. That's water. And um, the rule of thumb is a, a, a liter of water weighs a kilogram. So a kilo is about 2.2 pounds. So, so every two pounds is one liter to put back. Now, if you don't weigh yourself every day, you can just monitor the color of your urine. And if your urine is dark yellow, when you wake up in the morning, you're not drinking enough water. And, and um, it gets cumulative though, because, you know, you lose, I, I remember I, I had one of my really hard training runs. My, my Ironman was in July and in DC in July, it's pretty damn hard and humid. Right. And uh, I mean, I, I was out for an 80 mile, 80 mile run ride with a five mile brick run on the back end of it on, you know, 95 degree humid day. I think I drank five, six liters of water during the day. And I was still four or five pounds down when I got home. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Remarkable. So, um, yeah, it is. So I just wanted to let you know, I'm looking at some of the uh, the comments and questions that are going through in the chat right now. And uh, just to kind of puff you up a little bit, uh, Agni Das said, Dr. Loomis is 63. He looks like he's in his 40s. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Yeah. But you know, yeah. too, like I said earlier, that's how I feel. It's, it's just really astounding, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the next thing I want you to address is, you know, there's a lot of information out there about the power of uh, beets, uh, beet yeah. juice, but, you know, to, to help dilate vessels, get more yep. blood flow to working muscles. It's all about, yeah. I think, nitric oxide. That's exactly and, right. And as you know, my father is a huge fan yep. of green leafies for his heart patients. That's right. And again, again, what is the, what is the overlap? How, how does like eating green leafies and beets help with athletic performance. So it's the same exact thing, right? So, so, you know, our blood vessels have a, there's a, a single cell lining on the inside of the blood vessels called the endothelium and that controls the ability of the blood vessel to contract and dilate appropriately. And, and um, when we develop, there's a lot, a lot of things we do lifestyle wise, unhealthy diet, smoking, blood pressure, sedentary lifestyle, diabetes that impair endothelial function. And, and, and that's felt to be kind of the, one of the first things to happen as a precursor to developing coronary artery disease, heart disease. It's interesting because um, we also need endothelial function. I'm sure Dr. Spitz talked about this for erectile function. And many people now think that erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mine for heart disease, because it's one of the first things to go indicators that you're starting to develop endothelial dysfunction. Well, for, so an athlete needs strong endothelial function as well, because we, you know, we, we, we need to deliver as much oxygen as we can to our working muscles. And, and it's been, there's research that suggests that beat loading can increase endurance performance by up to 10%, which is a lot, right? That's um, like doping. That's like doping. It is, it is, it is. So, you know, not only does it increase athletic performance, it's like nature's Viagra. Um, right. And, um, and then, and then beats also are, are fairly potent antioxidants. And, and again, we talked earlier about, 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 the ability to recover because exercise in and of itself is a, is a highly inflammatory event. And it's because when yeah. we exercise, we generate what are called, uh, we, we burn oxygen. And one of the byproducts of that are called oxygen free radicals. And, 
And, and those, the oxygen free radicals in small doses are good, right? So they, they tell our muscles, hey, I'm getting ready to damage you, get ready to fix me when I'm done. But at high doses, they have, a, they have a, it's associated with increased risk for heart disease, cancer, diabetes, on and on and on. And our bodies have a very limited ability inherently, innately to mitigate oxidative stress. So the only way we can augment that is through dietary antioxidants. And the only place you find those is in plants because actually antioxidants are the plant's natural anti-inflammatory mechanism to protect itself yeah. from you know, bugs and, and funguses and things like that. And in general, the more color a food has, the higher the antioxidant capacity. Beautiful. And yeah, and what's, what's even amazing to me though, when I first started to do a deep dive in, 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 into you know, my own personal recover, maximizing the recovery from my, from my Ironman, I, I did a deep dive into anti, dietary antioxidants. Most people don't know this, but the foods that have one of the highest, what are called oric scores, that's a, me a measure of the antioxidant capacity of food, aren't, you know, I used to think it was blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, very potent antioxidants for sure. What is beans. it? It's beans. beans, dark beans, dark beans. It's the, the pigments in the skin of the bean are the most potent antioxidants out there. And so if you take a black bean and you cut it in half, what color is the middle, right? It's a creamy white, right? So it's the color, red pig, kidney beans, pinto beans, black beans. Um, again, so when you're using beans as your primary source of protein, yeah. guess what? Yeah. Anti-inflammatory, lots of fiber on and on and on. So, so again, that's the real beauty of all this, that, 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 the same foods that are going to increase, lower our risk for chronic disease are also going to increase our athletic ability to recover from athletic, athletic performance. And in fact, the muscle soreness and stiffness that you get after a hard workout yeah. comes from damage to the, to the muscles and ligaments, the cell walls, because of oxidative stress. Every athlete I talk to in Game Changers, I'm sure you've experienced it. I experienced it. When I started training hard, harder than I've ever trained in my life, I had, I, I rarely got sore, stiff. It was astounding that at 60 years old, 61 years old, when I'm training for this Ironman, how quickly I recovered. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I want to alternate now. We got, we got a slew of questions coming in for you, for, uh, for you from the audience. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to hit some of these. Um, one of my questions for you, and it's also the question that uh, Alina Alvarez has, is, Dr. Loomis, what about supplements? Are there any supplements as a athlete that I should be taking, whether it's iron, whether it's B12, yeah. ca uh, calcium? What are your thoughts? Right. So, so um, we could have a whole hour discussion about that. So, so the Reader's Digest version is B12 for sure. I, I personally recommend about 500 micrograms a day. That's a little on the high side, but I've never seen anyone come in either too high or too low on that dose. That's what I take. Yeah. Um, I do. One of the other drivers of inflammation um, is, is comes from the overconsumption of omega-6 fatty acids. So again, we could talk for a long time at this, but in general, we overconsume omega-6s and, and they create inflammation. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. And you're looking for a dietary ratio of about two to one, three to one. You can do that, but you have to go almost completely oil free because because the major source, even on a plant based diet of, of omega sixes are edible oils, even olive oil, for example, has a 13 to two omega six omega three ratio and what you're looking for is about three to one. So I, I do. I did take I do take a, a algae based omega three supplement to help right. boost that anti inflammatory. And then the other thing I used a little bit of was just turmeric and a turmeric ginger supplement. Again, it's just a potent anti-inflammatory for, you know, I'd had knee surgery and such. And, and I, I did use a little um, uh, turmeric and ginger, but other than that, you really don't need anything. I, there's plenty of iron in plants. There's plenty of calcium in plants. Uh, so you don't really need to worry about the rest of it. What about, uh, you mentioned iron, you know, obviously uh, for the people that don't know, you got a different type of iron. In yeah. Yeah. So, so, so yes, that, that Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. So the iron in we consume from meat is called heme iron. So it's, it's iron that's attached to the hemoglobin molecule. Hemoglobin is how we carry oxygen in our blood. So ba basically what we're doing is, is consuming that dead animal's blood, which is really disgusting when you think about it. Heme iron though is highly inflammatory. It's pro-inflammatory. It's also very easy for our bodies to absorb. There is iron in plants, but it's not bound to hemoglobin. It's called non-heme iron. Um, the problem is it is a little bit harder for our bodies to absorb, but 
If you co-ingest a source of vitamin C with these high iron foods, and those are legumes and green leafy vegetables and things like molasses and things like that, you'll see absorption rates that equal or exceed non-heme iron. So the idea is, again, snack on citrus fruit, red bell peppers, put a little lemon juice or, or, yeah. or, or lime juice in your soups or salads, things like that. And iron is not an issue. Yeah. The other thing I'll, I'd like to add to that is that I almost, I think of the non-heme iron as kind of a more intelligent form of iron because it is. Your, body, your body can regulate it and it doesn't That's exactly it right. much. That's uh, right. Whereas, whereas with the animal, the animal iron, you know, you can go into a state of what's it called? Homeo he hemochromatosis. Yeah. So we yeah. start to store the extra iron in our liver actually. And some people are genetically predisposed to that. It's right. very interesting. I, I've had, so the, the way we treat patients with hemochromatosis is you, you, you bloodlet, you, you have to go, you take blood out because yeah. you want to make them iron deficient. Yeah. I've had three or four patients now who, after they went on a plant-based diet, no longer had to get phlebotomy. They had wow. their blood drawn. Right. Because you're not storing all that extra iron. You're, you're just using what you need. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, all right. Michelle Keist wants to know, Dr. Loomis, um, what are your thoughts on collagen? It seems to be like a hot thing these days. Uh, well, um, so collagen is, is a, what makes up a lot of our connective tissue and our cartilage and ligaments and things like that. Yeah, here's the issue. I already, I mentioned this earlier. You know, collagen is a form of protein, yeah. right? And when we consume, if you, if you go eat, if you consume collagen, what happens to that? It gets broken down in our gut to yeah. the individual amino acids and we, we absorb them and we put it back together. So taking collagen has never been shown to really improve joint health function or joint health because you're not, it's like, it's not like the collagen is magically getting from your, from your gut into your joints intact, right? So as long as we're eating, you know, a healthy diet, then, then, then um, again, there's no, and, and plus, you know, collagen is, is animal based as well. That's really the only place you find it. It's in the connective tissue, uh, but there's no strong, there's no strong evidence that, that collagen has a health benefit supplemented. Yeah. Um, so David Hardin wants to know how about fat for someone that does vigorous strength training and cardio I struggle knowing how much I should get without putting my heart at risk. So, uh, if you, yeah. yeah. So if you look at the natural macronutrient ratios of a whole food plant-based diet, it's about 75% unprocessed carbs, about 15% protein and about 10% fat. Now we do need to consume some fat because we, we, there's, there's vitamins that we need to absorb that, that, that require fat. So um, again, a whole food plant-based diet, again, it's one of those other things. You just don't have to worry about it. Uh, the, the, where you get into trouble, there, there's two or three places that some people get into trouble. So one of the edible oils, which I, I don't consume uh, for the most part, I, you know, I try to be, stay away from that. Um, because, because again, um, um, most of these oils are very high in omega-6s. You can get into trouble with nuts and seeds. And so again, some, if, if there's a, if you have a, a lot of heart risk, um, I really have patients try to limit that. And again, I think using a, a food tracking app like Chronometer, typically you don't want to exude about 30, 35 grams of fat a day in, in your diet. That's, that's kind of the threshold that for, for healthy heart. And that, that, course, that corresponds to about that 10, 15, about 10% of fat for a normal, kind of the, the standard number of calories that most people consume. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, here is a question from Arlene, which actually is perfect because you and I were talking about this right before we went on. And that is, Dr. Loomis, would you recommend tart cherry juice for athletic recovery? <laughs> Maybe this yeah, is a good so, time for you to tell us about your, your recovery shake. Yeah. So, so when, as I was preparing to train for Ironman, I did a really deep dive into kind of the science of recovery and, you know, anti-inflammatory. And so I concocted a, a, uh, and so there are some foods that have, that have, evidence that show that, that they are highly anti-inflammatory. So like things like tart cherry juice, watercress is another one, um, watermelon actually. So, but what I, so I concocted a recovery shake that I would use. It included tart cherry juice as the base. I throw in some frozen banana just for, for the glycans and the carbs, yep. a big handful of kale. I put in some beet, beetroot powder or, or, or roasted beets. I put in cinnamon, turmeric, ginger, chia seed for the omega-3s. And I would drink that. And I, I told you this story. My son, 
now lives in Washington, D.C., and he's in his mid 20s. And he we would he took up cycling. So we would go this summer on 40, 50 mile bike rides in, in D.C. And, you know, he would tell me that he would get sore and stiff afterwards. So I brought him some of my recovery shake to, to, to drink after one of our long rides. And uh, I called him the next day and he said it was like amazing that that all the muscle soreness and stiffness that he had experienced best had gone went away completely. Um, that, and, and it's exactly what we're talking about. It's yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds food. delicious. I wish I had a big glass right here, right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm hungry. Uh, so we're getting lots of comments, Dr. Loomis, uh, on, so what are your thoughts on taking a plant-based protein powder, uh, especially after a workout, the bro science is everywhere. Right. So we've already, you know, the, it's funny because this, this question always comes up, right? So again, if you're eating a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet and consuming enough calories, you don't need to, you don't need to worry about it. Now, that being said, if you're using, say, a, say your little, your busy lifestyle and you get up in the morning and, you know, you don't have time to make a breakfast, using a little protein powder in a, in a, in a shake or something like that just to, is a meal replacement, not a supplement. That's okay. But again, it, it's back to this nutrition reductionism. When you, when you take you know, a pea and you, and you strip out all the fiber and all that and turn it into a powder or hemp, you know, you've stripped out all the omega threes and the fiber, which are helpful and just concentrate into the powder. You've lost, you've lost a lot of the nutritional value of those foods. And so, so if you have the luxury of, of, of just eating the plants, that's by far a better way to consume protein. So protein powder is a supplement is not necessary. If you're consuming enough calories, it may play a role in, we talked earlier about ensuring you're getting enough calories through the day. It may yeah. play a role in a busy lifestyle and, and, and is a meal replacement, if you will, but not as a supplement. So to dovetail on that, here's a question um, from Charlene Black. She says, Dr. Loomis, there's some pretty strong research suggesting that seniors need higher levels of protein. What is your understanding of the evidence? Well, you know, so, so first of all, you have to remember that almost all of this research that's done on nutrition <laughs> and, and is done on a population of people that is fundamentally unhealthy. They don't exercise. They're, they're, they live a sedentary lifestyle, so they, they lose muscle mass, right, as we age. Um, so so, so I, I am of the opinion I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'll be 63. I don't know if that's senior or not, but, but I don't, I mean, I don't take extra protein because I'm worried I'm going to, you know, end up on, in a, you know, on a walker because I, I eat a healthy diet and I exercise and I maintain muscle mass. So I think, again, I, I think you have to, there is research around that, but again, it's, it's in people who are lead a sedentary lifestyle. They eat a, a relatively unhealthy diet. Uh, they, they're losing that muscle mass. They're losing function. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and yes, in that situation, uh, that may be, that, that is true. But I think for, for someone who leads a healthy lifestyle, um, um, you probably don't need to worry too much about it. Yeah. Um, so I know you're in Saudi Arabia and you're speaking about, I think the benefits of exercise. That's right. For those people that have joined us that currently aren't engaging in any kind of regular physical activity or, or exercise. And I know you could give a two hour lecture on this, but I don't want you to go over two minutes because we got lots of questions, but yeah. like, what are some of the inherent benefits of exercise that should get people excited about moving? Well, the list goes on, right? So, so decrease risk for heart disease, healthy weight, lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, prevent and reverse diabetes, uh, bone health, cognition, dementia, lower risk for dementia, improving. It's as eff exercise is effective as antidepressants in the treatment of right. depression anxiety, lowers anxiety, improves sleep. I mean, um, improves immune function. Um, people who exercise regularly had a significantly decreased risk of, of having severe COVID, getting hospitalized by COVID and dying from COVID just from exercise, it will control for diet. So, right. so there's, I mean, across the board, uh, um, you know, cancer, breast cancer and colon cancer in particular, um, significantly decreased risk of both breast and colon cancer. Um, and, and people who are physically active compared to, to not. So, so again, you know, exercise is, it's, it's kind of part of the vital triad, right? 
It's about right, right. emotion. It's about, it's about physical wellness, the movement, nutritional wellness through what we eat and what we don't eat. And then our emotional wellness through, through stress management and recovery from stress through sleep. And it, and when we find that balance, that, that's really the key here. Yeah. That listen, that right there, like that was powerful, right? I mean, right. come on, that's, that's a lot of great reasons to get out there and move our bodies. Um, here's a question from Sam, make it simple. Um, Dr. Loomis, what is the recommendation or equation for how much exercise to do daily when dealing with heart disease? So this is somebody that has heart disease. Um, and if, is there any kind that you would recommend that I avoid? Well, I mean, um, as a disclaimer, that's something you, you certainly need to talk to your cardiologist about this. But, yeah. um, you know, it's really interesting. And this is something that I explored a lot in getting ready for these talks on exercise. You know, we, we actually did not evolve to exercise. What we evolved to do was be physically active, right? And exercise, physical activity has devolved into exercise in the modern world because physical activity is movement that burns calories. Exercise is a, is a willful event, right, to move. Yeah, they're, they're very different, aren't they? They are. And, and so, so really, the key to really preventing these chronic diseases is not training for an Ironman necessarily. It's, it's, it's to move, it's to be physically active. And we need, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, most days, something to get your heart rate up a couple days a week. We need to, you know, replicate picking stuff up, moving out of the way, light weights. I mean, th that's really it. This is this, and it doesn't matter. You know, we, 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 you know, walk, taking a walk after dinner, walking the dog, kicking a sock around with your kids, hiking the woods, you know, bike ride around the neighborhood, take the stairs instead of the elevator, park on the far in the parking lot. And it's even been shown that you can break up that activity into three 10 minute blocks during the day. And it's almost as effective as 30 minutes. Yeah. And so, um, you know, so, so that's really the key um, for, for, for even if you've had a heart attack, um, cardiac rehab is a very important part of that. We know that when we, when we perform regular physical activity, we grow new blood vessels, athletes grow new blood vessels, capillaries to increase blood flow to their legs. They increase blood flow to the heart. That's also true for patients with heart disease. So, so there's really no restrictions. I mean, but again, that's something you probably want to uh, discuss with your, especially if you're talking about doing something, you know, training for a marathon or, you know, a, a 10K or something like that. That is something you probably want to talk to your, uh, your cardiologist yeah. about. Well, to me, what you just expressed there and your difference between um, like physical activity and exercise it's kind of what Dan Buettner has been talking about with the blue zones, right? Right. That's so exactly right. Naturally, they naturally move because it's part of their everyday existence. Right. And it, so, yeah. so, you know, I mean, think about it. Think of, I say, I would suspect that your great, 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 great grandparents would find it bizarre that you, because you sit around, not you, but we sit around in front of a computer all day that we have to pay money to go to a place to get on some machine that we don't want to be on, right? That we don't, we, you know, it makes us sweat and we don't like the way we look in clothes and, you know, it's painful. That's, it's kind of crazy if you think about it. And, and so really it's, 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 it's really about just incorporating physical activity in your day-to-day routine, -day, whether it be exercise or not. I and mean, that's really the key, right? Yeah, yeah. Here's a comment. This is just a, a nice, fun comment from Kathleen Sullivan. She says, as a 56 year old tennis player, who had four consecutive matches in the past four days. I have no soreness right. like I used to when I was a vegetarian eating lots of oil and cheese. Right. That's uh, exactly right. Yeah. So what, what, what fact, is it about, about the oil and cheese that's given her soreness? Well, it's again, we, we just talked about it. It's, it's, it's the, the high level. So A, it's the lack of, lack of antioxidants, right? When you're eating yeah. oil and cheese, there's no antioxidants. And the biggest source of saturated fat, that's the, what's the omega-6s, is yep. in the American diet is dairy, right? It's dairy and oil. Um, and so, and, and it, it's also in meat because it's really because of what we feed, you know, corn oil, for example, corn oil has an 83 to one omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. It's the most highly inflammatory oil you can consume. How do we fatten up cows, pigs, chickens, corn? They actually mix corn oil into the feed and that gets into the eggs, it gets into the cheese and the, you know, the dairy and on and on and on. So that's the reason why. So it's the lack, it's when you're consuming that, you're not consuming antioxidants yeah. Yeah. and you're over consuming omega-6s. Um, wow. You know, you know, I've actually also 
read a lot of research showing that the healthiest, most anti-inflammatory nut is the walnut. That right. it's, it's about three to one, omega right. six to omega three. Yeah. And then, and then the most unhealthy pro-inflammatory nut is the almond. It's 2,500 to one. Right. Yeah. So you have to be careful. That's what I said earlier. You have to be very careful with, with nuts. I mean, again, if, if you're, if you, you know, is one walnut going to hurt you? No. Yeah. Right. Eating it, you know, eating a huge handful of walnuts every day. And people get sidetracked with that because it is, you know, it is a plant-based food and it is, it is an unprocessed whole food, plant-based food. But as you said, you have to be very, very careful with, with, with nuts and seeds um, and restrict and, 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 and because of that they are in fact also very calorically dense because of the fat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're just getting flooded now with comments on oil and really is it, you know, should, should I be emitting oil? Do I, well, so, isn't, a little bit, isn't a little bit good for, for optimal health. And so let know, me, people, let me re people, people do not want to hear. Right. You, right. You're telling them they can't have their olive or their safflower yeah, yeah. or whatever. So, so let's reframe this for just a second. So think about money. When we have extra money, we want to invest it in our, in our financial future. And what we're looking for is a positive ROI, right? Yeah. Return on investment. That's how we should think about our calories because every calorie you put in your mouth is either an investment in your health future or it's not. And let's just say you have 100 calories to invest in your health right this minute and you could invest it in olive oil or coconut oil because you heard that was healthy, it's boneless, skinless chicken breast or broccoli. What's the nutritional ROI of 100 calories of olive oil? Well, first of all, it's only about a tablespoon. How much space does that take up in your stomach? Not very much. What do you get back from that nutritionally besides fat? How much protein? Zero. Yeah. How much cancer fighting phytonutrients? Zero. How much fiber? Zero. How many, you know, edible oils are the absolute worst return on your nutritional investment that you can consume. You know, yeah. it's 4,000 calories per pound. Yeah. Right? A pound of broccoli is a hundred calories. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Right. 40, so, 40, so, 40 X difference. Yeah, exactly. You know, hundred calories of boneless, skinless chicken breast or steak or salmon is about an ounce. What do you get back from that protein and fat? There's none of this other, you know, cancer fighting phytonutrients, antioxidants, recovery on and on broccoli, you know, hundred calories is 12 ounces, 14 ounces. It's a lot of broccoli. What else do you get? You get protein on and on and on. So just reframing this, not should we be, you know, just out, take it out of it and just look at it from a nutritional ROI standpoint, whether you're trying to lead a healthy lifestyle, prevent, treat, reverse chronic disease, athletic performance. I think reframing is in the, in the, in terms of nutritional ROI should, should, I think, give some clarity on why oils are not so, not so helpful. I like that. That was a really good analogy. Really, yeah. really good. Um, so let me ask you, uh, we're getting, we're getting some questions here and I, I want to see if you can address both these and I feel like you have, but they're still pouring in. So let's say you're an athlete that's trying to lose weight right. on a plant-based diet. What do you do? And let's say you're an athlete that's trying to gain weight on a plant-based diet. Do you want to address um, calorie density for a second? Would, would that be helpful for this cr crowd? Yeah. I mean, I mean, again, it's this, it's this whole idea. I mean, you, you do have to be careful. And so, so again, the, the thing is, if you want to lose weight, a plant-based diet's great because you you know, it is so calorie dense, right? Um, calorie you know, light. You want to gain, calorie light. Yeah, come again. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so nutrient dense. Sorry, yeah. nutrient yeah. dense. Yeah, not calorie dense. The, the the bigger challenge is actually to gain weight. We've already talked about that, right? Yeah. Because 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 it is so nutrient dense, and and you know, you you really have to beef up your calorie game. So again, it's just as simple as just just cutting back a little bit and 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 creating that calorie deficit you need to lose a little bit of weight. Uh, frankly, though, you know, what I found was, um, you know, I, I just listen to my body, right? When I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm not hungry, I don't eat. You know, we're kind of programmed three meals a day, three squares on and on. Yeah. Um, I've had some success personally, and even with athletic performance, they're, they're in, in, in a training build, doing some intermittent fasting. There, there is some evidence that may increase insulin sensitivity, which makes you more efficient at burning fat over the long run. That's a, that's one way doing intermittent fasting, you know, a 16, eight strategy where, which really isn't, it's more time restricted eating where you, you take all your calories in an eight hour window, or you do a couple of days a week, you do a 24 hour water fast kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's another way to kind of accelerate the weight loss. And, and if you do that smartly, uh, it, it won't, it won't, it shouldn't affect your, 
your athletic performance in kind of the early part of a training cycle if you're if you're a competitive athlete. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, so we are, we have come to uh, the close of uh, of our fourth uh, rescue event. I, I want you to get back to bed because sleep, <laughs> sleep is a very important pillar. And what is it? 4.08 a.m. there now? Yeah, exactly. Yes, it is. Oh, my goodness so. gracious. But I want to thank you, uh, Jim, for, for joining us from Saudi Arabia. You know, we've, we've got close to a thousand people that have heard you here live tonight. And, uh, you know, the your wisdom on this subject is really um, unparalleled. And so thank you for sharing with everybody. No, oh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. This has really been uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, our pleasure. Let me just say before uh, we hang up with Jim, you know, uh, we had people from Australia, Canada, New York, California, uh, like 30 other states. I absolutely adore this community. Um, and a reminder for everybody, just visit the comment section and you can get your free downloadable recipe guide for the big game next Sunday. Jim's rooting for the Rams. I'm rooting for the Bengals. We'll see. Uh, we'll see who comes up on top. What do you want to bet? You want to bet a, uh, a plant-based dinner somewhere? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, can I add one more thing real quick? Rip Please, please absolutely. So, so, absolutely cause so my, I, yeah, because I also want you to let people know where where they can go for more information. On yeah, you so that's what I was just going to lead into. So, so my, my good friend and colleague in St. Louis, uh, Karen Dugan, has a Center for Plant-Based Living, which is a, a brick-and-mortar culinary education center around teaching kitchen, uh, helping people develop culinary literacy. Um, we, we're doing some online programming, and later this spring, the date hasn't been determined, we're actually going to do a, um, a half-day seminar on exactly this subject, do a deeper dive, along with some cooking, cooking demos, portables to take with you. So um, 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 you, we, will, we will have more information about that. I think it'll probably be the links will come out for the podcast is my understanding, but um, yeah, we'll um, put them in there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and I do do, you know, telehealth I'm licensed in a few States, uh, Florida, DC, Missouri, um, um, uh, Maryland, and Virginia. You can go to barnardmedicalcenter.org and find more information. We have other providers who are uh, all licensed in other states. If you're looking for a plant-based provider, I know you had uh, Lori on uh, yes. you know, uh, last week. We, we offer some of those similar services. We have some. We have plant-based dietitians available. So if you're interested and in, and in, you know if you've got some chronic health issues you'd like to have addressed, uh, feel. I'd love to see you online as a patient. Fantastic. Hey Jim, are you gonna wake up and go for a run? What's the weather like there? Well, so. One of the, so the, the first of all, it's it's relatively cool. I mean, seventy during the day, forty at night, kind of desert winter. The problem, but I tell you something, the the infrastructure here, the build environment for exercise here is completely non-existent. There are no sidewalks. There's no there's absolutely no place to go for a run. I mean, I, I'm going to have to unfortunately get on the treadmill. Oh, I'm afraid, uh -oh. uh, uh, or, or bike in the gym here because um, um, it, it's it's really the, the reason. And the reason is it's you know in the summertime it's 120 degrees every day. So so they haven't made that investment. Uh, there's a big mall culture. People walk in and such. But one of the things they're trying to change, by the way, but. Uh, um, I'm not going for a run, unfortunately. I would love to. The weather's beautiful, nice and sunny, 70 degrees, perfect running weather. But yeah. uh, I don't feel like getting run over by a car here. In <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> right, right. We, we need you alive and well. Right, uh -huh. right. All right. Well, hey, everybody, I hope you enjoy the remainder of the Olympics. Um, you know, a lot of excitement going on right now uh, over in China. You know, the big the big game next Sunday, Jim's going for the Rams. I'm going for the Bengals. Would love to hear who you're going for. And uh, if you want to send this out to your friends or listen to it again, we'll be posting it as part of the Plant Strong podcast this Thursday, February 10th. With that, let me just say peace. Engine two, keep it plant 